Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this week I have a special video for you, an interview with knitwear designer Rachel Ilsley, who is the designer behind the Orbitz pullover that I've talked about in a few of my podcast episodes. She is also the designer of more than 25 sweaters at last count. Her newest one out is Blum, which is a beautiful all-over colorwork design. And Rachel was kind enough to sit down with me on Zoom for a fun conversation and I hope you'll enjoy learning more about her process and her designs and uh, her life uh, in England. So let's get on over to the interview now and I hope you enjoy getting to know a little bit more about Rachel Ilsley. I was thinking we should start with just like the basics like um, you know I know you've been designing sweaters um, since 2018 is that correct? Um, yeah I think it's well, it's three and a half years since I released my first pattern. So I didn't start with sweaters straight away. Okay. Uh, used myself in with a few accessories first. Uh, so, but yeah, it's probably, it's probably not far off three years now that I started working on sweater designs. Yeah. I remember seeing the night book sweater and I, I remember seeing it on Ravelry and thinking, oh my gosh, like this is someone I'm very curious about because it was, you know, my first introduction to you was to see that sweater. Yeah. And of all the sweaters, I mean, that is a beautiful all over color, really complicated, you know, it's got a lot of different, it looks to me like it has a lot of different moving parts. I know how color work works, but, you know, I thought to myself, this is, this is someone who's going to be doing some cool design work. And um, so I started following your patterns on Instagram and then of course orbits came out so I was like that was the first one I jumped on um and I think partially it was because I had I started color work late in my knitting career and I'm I'm curious to hear a little bit about your how you started knitting and how you got into color work and was that the first I know it's your big love but was that your first love was that the thing that kind of brought you into knitting again or um I think I think I did I, I remember seeing examples of work early on and being really curious this was when I was a complete beginner like being really curious about how you even make that happen I did, like, I did <laughs> on that really basic level of how is that possible so I kind of went down a bit of um, a YouTube rabbit hole to try myself um so then my, my grandma started me with the absolute basics of knitting. Um, I didn't live close enough to her to sort of pop over every few minutes with a question. So um, I YouTubed it and kind of as soon as I saw um, an example of somebody working the color work, I just mm -hmm. thought, oh, this is something that I, I understand and I think I would really enjoy doing. Um, but for me, the first step then beyond actually understanding how it worked was um learning to hold the yarn in both hands so I'm I'm a two-handed color work knitter so I have and originally I learned to knit English style the throwing style so I started off by trying to teach myself to knit right-handed so that I'd be kind of able to hold one yarn in each hand it, to me it seems like the easier way to do it so I started with that and then you know once I was reasonably okay with continental knitting I was kind of pretty keen to to give color work a go and it went from there really it's kind of amazing I mean I look at your designs and I think they they just look like such sophisticated color work and I think a lot of people feel that way when they see them because they are so complex you have the motifs kind of running down the center even the sweater you're wearing right now I'm trying to remember the name of it um which one uh, is that one it's Bloom. that's right it's the newer it's one of the newer ones right uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have this beautiful band oftentimes of color work running down the center and then it's kind of flanked by other color work in, this, in these all over. And then the other ones have color work kind of in, a, in an interesting place to my eye. You know, it's kind of like, like I think about Orbit, it's, you know, it starts at a certain point and it's not just, you know, held up in the yoke. It's like it goes through the body and the sleeves, which is really an interesting way of doing color work that I don't, to I look a lot on Ravelry and it's not something I always see, you know, designers doing. It's a really interesting placement. So I, I'm curious to have, if you'd want to talk about that a little bit, if that's something that you think about when you put your color work on your sweaters. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is I imagine a lot of people avoid doing it because the maths involved is such a nightmare. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the easiest and it's certainly um, in some of my 
earliest designs, including Nightbook, actually, I've avoided that completely. So Nightbook actually does, although it's quite hard to tell on the design, it has separate a separate yoke color work. And then there's just a tiny space where you're working with just the main color where you actually separate into the sleeves. Um, but I think that for me, it was really just, it was about aesthetics, I suppose, that I knew that for me personally, possibly being quite broad shouldered, I don't know, but um, having color work just around the yoke, I can I think can look really lovely but I don't always want to be limited to only having the color work around the yoke and actually for me um having the color work extend a little bit further down into the body and to the sleeves is uh I suppose more flattering and also I think it gives you obviously a greater number of rounds to play with so you can do more complex designs you can create that kind of elongated pattern that you can't if you're just constrained to the number of rounds in a yoke and I think often when I sit especially when I was starting out with knitwear design um, being self-taught I was often presented with an idea of what I wanted to create but not knowing actually how to, to go about creating it and being a bit kind of I don't know but, um, I don't know what the word is but kind of just trying to to not let that phase me and figure it out for myself um, has always kind of been my approach uh, keep trying until it works basically so with the color work designs that extend into the body and the sleeves now I think I've found pretty good ways around the maths involved in those so that it's relatively easy for me to grade those kind of designs but it's also not too horrific for the knitter who actually has to then work on those designs it's funny because I, the math was one of my questions, like down the line, if you were willing to talk about it, because I'm so curious about, um, I, I've done just a couple of sweaters myself, and I know that the grading can be uh, one of those things that designers can sometimes send off to a, a tech editor or a grader, you know, to do, but it seems like you're doing your own grading for these patterns, which is potentially time intensive. You know, it's, I don't know if you're doing it by hand or if you're using a spreadsheet or how you're going about it, but I'd, I'd love to hear just my own sweater nerdy mathiness I'm really curious to hear more about how you're doing it of course yeah I mean, the funny thing for me is um when I was at school maths was not my favorite subject at all I could do it but it didn't interest me in the slightest you know it's just one of those things that I had to do because it's a core subject um and really it's only when I got into knitwear design that I realized that you could actually enjoy maths as as a process to reach a creative goal. So for me now, I, I love that part, which, which I, I never thought I would, um, that part where you kind of, you know what you want to create. You've got kind of some of the numbers figured out and it's getting all those bits to fit together in kind of almost like a logic puzzle, I guess. Um, and I, I actually really do enjoy the challenge of that. It is definitely difficult for me, but um, I do really enjoy it. Um, in terms of how I work, I use I do use a spreadsheet, um, which is really helpful because uh, for at least some of the time you can use it to double check what you think is going to work out and check that the numbers are actually working out the way that you think they're going to work out. I use it to calculate yardage as well and things like that, which is really helpful. Um, and it's just so much faster in terms of converting everything with inches and centimeters and and so on but I, ha I have to say I have a very basic grasp of spreadsheets so I can do a few basic formulas but that's about it there may well be faster ways of doing what I do but this is what I figured out uh, I feel like that's kind of reassuring though for, especially for I, I have some beginning designers who often watch on YouTube and I think for a, for a lot of people who are just getting started in design it's reassuring to hear that these are things you can take on and be self-taught and figure out you know as you go and kind of you know trial and error and things like that so it's I think it's reassuring to hear that kind of thing especially from someone like you who's designing these really they look elaborate and I know from knitting one that they're very it, the instructions are incredibly clear and they're easy to follow but you know they the finished piece looks you know really elegant and elaborate and cool you know to the eye so I think that's I think it's reassuring <laughs> Do you remember um Try to work on my first colorwork sweater which is called the lost city and um 
I, because it was the first one that I'd done, um, I can remember sort of grading the first sort of almost two thirds of the yoke and then writing that bit of the pattern and then having to knit that bit because I was just so unsure about whether it was actually going to work out correctly or not. Um, and it, was, it took me absolutely ages because, it, you know, ev everything's a learning curve, isn't it? But um, definitely worth persevering with for sure. And I'm, I'm curious to ask too, because I know with a, um, some Colorworks sweaters that I've worked on, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say that they're clunkier or something. I, I keep using that term lately, clunky, but, but sometimes with color work patterns, I, I think designers might get stuck thinking, well, I have a, a 16 stitch repeat. And so I have to, you know, keep using that around. And that means that my sizing can only be X, you know, like I can have one size here, one size here with a pattern repeat kind of uh, dictating what happens with the color work. I feel like your sweaters don't really work that way. And I, I love that about them because I feel like that there's more flexibility to the sizing if you do some of the, I mean, I don't want to give away the pattern, but there are some things, there are some moves that you make in the yoke and in your increases um, with the top down sweaters that give you a lot more flexibility with the color work, I think. And I'm, I'm curious if that's something that you're, I'm sure it's something you're aware of, but I'm, I'm curious how you talk about it a little bit if you would. Yes, um, I think, I think when I approach uh, my pattern writing, I suppose the user experience of the knitter is the number one priority. And I know that when I started out first trying to learn about grading and about, um, you know, being size inclusive and making sure that everybody can access the patterns that I was writing. Um, when I was looking at, you know, various bits of data that's been collected about average sizes, I realized I don't fit into any <laughs> a one average size. So I'm like a real mixture of a few different sizes, partly because I'm tall, um, you know, slightly broad shoulders, arms like an orangutan. Um, all of those things combined mean that I could never follow a pattern written for a standard size. And so I figured if if that's not going to work for me, it's probably not going to work for a lot of other people as well. Um, and so I try to put into my patterns as much flexibility as I can. So, you know, there are options about where you separate for the yoke into the body and sleeves. There are options for sleeve circumference, sleeve lengths, you know, body lengths, anything that I can do to, to give the knitter all the information, all the tools that they would need to create something that they're going to love and love to wear and that will fit them. I feel like that's something that um, the designers that I know who have come from more of like a knit, you know, they're, they were knitters first and really um, needed those differences in sizes and wanted to modify the patterns. I feel like those, when they become designers, they, I've worked with a few of them and they tend to include all of that stuff in their patterns because they know this is what a knitter is going to ask, you know, oh, how, how can I make the yoke a little bit deeper? Or how can I extend the sleeve? Or what happens if I change this color work? You know, and I've appreciated that about your patterns. I, when I first saw your pattern, when I downloaded it, um, I was just, I saw all the tables and the charts, like, like all of the different options that I just, I was so excited because I thought, oh, this is someone who does what I do, <laughs> who really <laughs> likes to like get in the pattern and show how it works as opposed to just giving it to you as a kind of rote thing that needs to be followed. So yeah, exactly. I think as well for me, I can remember very early as a knitter, sort of trying to blindly follow a pattern, um, and feeling quite lost about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And, and to some extent, that knowledge can come with experience, obviously. Um, but you know, you, you kind of, I suppose, I don't want relatively new knitters to feel like they couldn't access. A pattern or they couldn't customize one of my patterns just from lack of experience you, you know if you're going to spend hours knitting something you would like it to be right first time if at all possible <laughs> yes I totally agree um so I'm curious uh, the other one of the other veins that I'm curious about in your patterns is that um I, I believe the was it nightbook and um we have a collection I can't remember the second one but they're inspired by musical composers. Is that correct? So I'm, yeah. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about like, how do you, um, I do a lot of science and literature. So I'm thinking like almost like synesthesia, like 
thinking about music and how it, trans, you know, how you would see music or something. But I'm curious to hear you talk about maybe how you translate music into a into a color work pattern. Like, what is that process like for you creatively? Um, it's it's one of my favorite things to do, actually. Um, I just feel when I'm in the process of working on it, it feels. Uh, I don't know, difficult to difficult to describe. It just feels so kind of deeply immersed in that creative flow almost that maybe sounds a little bit ridiculous but that's the best way I can describe it so yeah the collection you're talking about is the Ian Audi collection it's all works by the composer uh, Ludovico Ian Audi and it started with Nightbook um, and uh, I can remember when sort of inspiration struck if you like because um, I've got two young children this was a couple of years ago and um, it was uh, a pretty unusual occurrence in that I was making dinner and my girls were magically off playing nicely together and not interrupting or pestering for anything and I was kind of just you know really chilled out enjoying making dinner and I had um, I and Audi I had music on while I was cooking and Nightbook came on I was just kind of listening to it and, and yeah just enjoying this rare moment of peace I suppose and then I realized as I was listening to the music that um, as you say it, it very much was creating uh, patterns I suppose in my mind and the way I would interpret the melodies you know rising and falling creates patterns and as I kind of listened more to the music I realized it would kind of develop into this you know what to me seemed like a really beautiful um design and uh like in that moment it just was like oh my goodness I could see the matrix <laughs> it's like so amazing <laughs> um but then of course was the challenge of actually taking what I'd kind of imagined in my head and actually putting it into a into a concrete pattern which was obviously like a, a whole other challenge I suppose <laughs> Um, but I, I do have a musical background, um, which maybe helps. So um, I studied music a lot at school and you know, play a few instruments. So I suppose for me, um, that all probably plays into uh, the creative side of <clears throat> taking, taking music and turning it into a design. Yeah, I would, I, I, uh, would guess if you have a musical background, like you're your creativity is probably tied into some of that. Like that's part of how you think creatively is through music and playing music and reading music and, you know, singing or, or playing instruments or whatever it is. So I imagine that that would kind of translate pretty well and be an interesting like source of inspiration. And I'm, I'm really curious as someone who's interested in music, but not very musical, like, <laughs> um, you know, I think about the ways that like when I look at your designs now I'm going to be looking for those kinds of things like and trying yeah. to imagine like how the how it sounds I want I kind of want to listen to Nightbook now and like look at your sweater and just have a moment of like hmm how does this work yeah I think you should because uh, like especially if you look right at the top of the yoke there's like mm -hmm. a very the start of it is a very literal translation of what you're seeing on what you're hearing sorry on um in the music so that's gonna be cool. I'm now I'm really excited to just have that kind of like moment. <laughs> um, so it seems like uh, I want to come back around to this life balance question in a minute, but I I also want to ask about um, one more design question, which is like you seem to create these these real like I would call them like statement pieces, like the sweater that you're wearing, Blum or Nightbook. You know these these all over color work patterns that are uh, just they're they're visually just kind of stunning but they're you know they really catch your eye they're they're the kind of sweater that you know you wouldn't just pass by and say oh this is well that's just a, that's just another pullover or whatever you know but you also create really wearable things like accessories and I know you have a couple of sweaters like um I when I look at your you know profile or your portfolio I think about something like hug um yeah. as a very wear I mean they're all wearable but that one those seem a little bit more like everyday like kind of sweaters yeah yeah so how do you think about the diff I mean the difference between them? And I'm kind of curious what what you have more in your wardrobe. Like, do you wear more statement pieces or do you do the more kind of like, you know, everyday wearables better? Yeah. Um, I think 
as from a knitter's point of view, I prefer working on the statement pieces because I lose interest in things very easily. <laughs> it's a very short attention span. Um, so, you know, like I, I really like my hug sweater. I wear it loads. It's so comfortable. Um, but I, I wouldn't rush to design another thing as basic as that because you know I've got one now and um and uh, I just I think I struggle with that all over stockinette kind of I, I struggle to stay motivated to be honest as a knitter um I think I'm just a little bit more um easily distracted by something more exciting or by the next design idea that I've got so I think so what I'm obviously I'm going to continue to do the color work because I absolutely love the color work. Um, at the moment, I'm also working on some kind of cabled pieces because uh, I've just recently kind of discovered a way that I can work cables that really interest me and that aesthetically I really enjoy. So, and I feel like in a way, cables can be almost as wearable as something that's a basic sweater like like the hug because it's just that all over color but you've just got that interesting texture um, as well so yeah a bit of cable work coming up hopefully um but yeah no plans to do another hug just because it's just because I just get bored too easily <laughs> I will say like as a knitter you know doing the orbit sweater was incredibly fun I, I will do I will do oceans of stock net because I often have meetings and other things where I need to just be able to sit there and kind of like that's that's the project I'll pick up it's like the the body of you know I'm working on Icelandic sweater next and I know there's going to be you know acres of stock net that's going to be perfect for all the meetings I have um but with years I really did did appreciate that because the color work extended there was just you know a little bit of relaxing stock net toward the end you know just finish it out and it, I thought that was kind of nice you know, I think that's probably why I do it just yeah. extend fun for a bit longer <laughs> yeah. there's there's the other yeah. I'm really excited about your cables because I think I mean I imagine um the way that you would think about cables might be a kind of unique uh, you might have a unique perspective yeah. on that technique I've so things if you like yeah, while we're exactly. here of what I'm talking about yeah. so I've got the solarium hat that's already released um Let's see if I can find a way to show you. So there you go. So where I live, we're really close to um, a National Trust property called Fountains Abbey. And it's these ruins of an old um, abbey where monks used to live. Um, and uh, it's a really cool place to visit. And a lot of it is really well preserved and intact. And, you know, my girls just love running around there playing hide and seek and stuff. Um, but part of it is, um, is called the Solarium. And it has these beautiful arched ceiling, a kind of architectural structure. And I, I don't know whether that's really going to show up very well, but um, it is, it is, and it's idea, gorgeous. <laughs> but, um, those cables came from that. And I let's see if I can show you the crown because I love the way it all converges. But anyway, it's on my Ravelry, so you can check it out there if you want to as well. Um, but these are all twisted knit cables. And um, it turns out twisted knit cables is my thing. I really like it. <laughs> uh, so I got a little while ago, I got the knitting stitch, the Japanese knitting stitch Bible, the book. And um, it kind of opened my eyes to how different um, cables can look by working these really delicate kind of um, single columns and of um, twisted knit stitches. Uh, and I just I love that aesthetic it's you know delicate in the way that I like my color work to be um so yeah that's that's what I'm working on at the moment and I'm just doing a sweater which I can I've only got the yoke of it done but I can show you if I can drag it that over would be here. Awesome. yeah <laughs> okay okay oh, I don't know if I can get it close enough um, oh wow no I can see it perfectly so wow. it's kind of it starts off with just a twisted knit um, neckline, which then flows into these kind of growing, almost like leaf or petal shapes down the yoke. Um, and that's what I've got so far, but I'm really enjoying it. Uh, something a bit different. I, I'll still be doing the color work, but it's nice yeah. to, to challenge myself to do new things, I think. Yeah. 
I I'm sure that I'll be casting that one on as soon as it comes out because I love one of my first loves was cable. That was how I kind of got into knitting. And like you were saying earlier, you know, sometimes you just it's just good to just jump into things, even if you don't think you can or don't know how. You don't know what you don't know, so just go for it. Um, and I love I love that delicate cable. I think that you know, looking at your hat and the way that the arches kind of work, and they I, that's one of the things I loved about Orbit is the way that you kind of created. Uh, this color work that had, um, well, it's almost like it has texture to it because it gets thicker at certain points and then it kind of gets down to these spindly things toward the bottom. Like you really have a way of, of playing with texture and color work in color work at the same time. So I'm not surprised to see some of that translate over to the cables, which are beautiful. I love them. So that's really exciting. <laughs> Um, one of the things I was going to ask actually is about the place you live and like what inspiration is around you. And it sounds like you have some neat old kind of ruins to look at, but are there other things around you that, or places that you've traveled aside from your home or away from your home that have been inspiring for your designs? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, where we live is North Yorkshire. It's a small town called Boroughbridge and uh, it's in North Yorkshire, which is the north of England. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I do think most of England is, has got quite a lot of historic stuff going on. It's, it's no secret. Uh, but where we are is just really lovely. It's very beautiful, um, relatively rural which I like. I like being able to walk not too far from my house and get out into the fields and countryside and what have you. Um, but yeah, I mean, where we live, there's, you know, sites of Roman ruins, there's um, Fountains Abbey that I already mentioned, there's the ruins of quite a few different abbeys in the local area. Um, and I think all of that definitely plays into, um, into sources, of, sources of inspiration for me. Um, but I think, like, <laughs> I think for me, it sounds a bit strange. Um, often the source of, of inspiration can come from like the most unexpected places like uh, floor tiles or a wallpaper pattern or, you know, just all sorts of things. And, and you know, shapes in nature as well, for sure. Um, I think, yeah, the nice thing about the work that I do is that inspiration can literally come from anywhere um, and sometimes really unexpected places, which I, I do like that. I love this idea of like the, um, even just like the minutia or the everyday being an inspiration because it's often, I'll, you know, often talk to um, artists or creative people. And that's one of the things that they mentioned that I think a lot of a lot of you know onlookers don't necessarily recognize is that you know there there really can be that moment of you know just you're you're somewhere and you just happen to be staring at the wallpaper or you know the floor or something and you you know you start to see repetition and pattern and it's those things that can be really beautiful and that you can you know if you can translate them it can be really um it, it can be the kind of patterns that that other people will appreciate that they didn't necessarily see or know how to see or think to see or something like that so yeah it's cool to hear that I mean I think if you look at like I've got an ongoing collection at the moment which is the organics collection which is all um you know designs inspired either directly by nature or by other artists whose work is um, inspired by nature and I've got like um the Ashmore which is inspired by um uh pressed flower art a pressed flower artist um and I've got Bloom which and this is inspired by a French tattoo artist whose work is like lots of you know really beautiful shapes and designs that come from nature um, and coming up in this design I'm doing a, a textured shawl which is based on a shell artist so near where we live there's a stately home called Newby Hall and they've got two pavilions in their garden where they commissioned a shell artist to create these beautiful um, murals on the wall all out of shells that have been um, either foraged from beaches or are actually waste products from the food industry and taken all of those and kind of put them into this beautiful um, mural on the wall. So there's a, a shawl that's coming up that's inspired by that. That just sounds amazing. I love, I, I especially love that idea of like the waste products being then, you know, recycled into this beautiful artistic kind of display or something. Oh, that sounds cool. So can we go back to life balance a little bit? Because I know, as you said, you have two young, I think both 
five and under, two young daughters, is that right? Yeah, so Charlotte is eight and Lauren is four. Okay. So girls, yeah. But um, I mean, if you're hoping for pearls of wisdom from me about work-life balance, you're going to be very disappointed, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. <laughs> I just know um, I, a lot of people ask, you know, um, how do you, I was, and I was talking to Felicia of Sweet Georgia and we, we often have these conversations among us, you know, like, how do you, how do you get everything done? Like, how do you, you know, have a, a day job or not? And then family and then, you know, how do you do all of it? And, and I'm often asked that. So I just thought I'd pass it on to you and see, see how, how do you answer that question? How do you do it all? Hey, <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I think, for me, I think that one of the most helpful things that I've done recently is kind of almost take a step back from that idea that work-life balance is this achievable thing that exists, that people, you know, in films and media and adverts are showing us it's perfectly possible if you just try hard enough. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but I've kind of, I think I've often in the past, and even now, to be honest, put too much pressure on myself kind of believing that this you know this idea of you'll, you'll reach this kind of perfect moment where you've ticked off all the things on your list and everybody's happy and smiling and skipping through meadows of flowers or whatever you're supposed to be doing um and I just don't think it's particularly helpful certainly for me um and I'm sure for others as well to um to get too hung up on achieving that because I'm just not convinced that it's actually achievable I think for me I've got you know various different uh, responsibilities um, that are really important to me and how I prioritize those responsibilities is just kind of a, a constant juggling act almost you know it's it's spinning plates that you just have to try and keep on top of as much as possible um, so I mean yeah, I don't have hugely helpful advice, I don't think, other than to say, don't worry too much about your life being perfect, because like, it's so easy to look at other people, isn't it? And to think, they've got it sorted, why haven't I? Whereas actually, I think everybody thinks that really. <laughs> I think it's really helpful to hear, I mean, to be to hear other people being honest about this idea that, you know, that about this balance it's kind of like a myth it's this projection out there in the world that we're all supposed to achieve and I think it's actually really helpful to hear people saying no to that you know or, or just you know recognizing that it's not something that they're interested in you know that it's it's maybe a false uh, goal or something like that to get to that place I think that's really helpful um, yeah. so thank you <laughs> thanks for saying that <laughs> um, I'm also curious if, um, you know, on this topic of like, how much do you do and what do you do? If you'd ever consider, um, I, I believe you were a teacher maybe before this, would, would you ever be interested in teaching knitting or have you at festivals or at other things like that? I haven't yet. Um, I mean, unless you count teaching my daughters. <laughs> um, so. I mean, I've never taught a sort of, you know, a, a yarn festival or anything like that. Um, it's not something I'd necessarily be against doing, um, but I think at the moment, certainly my time is quite limited. In, and so I just need to be a little bit careful about what I say yes to um, uh, in terms of kind of just, you know, maintaining all those spinning plates. <laughs> Um, I think I really like the idea of teaching children to knit. I think that would actually combine both of my careers in a really nice way. Um, I think it might be, a, it would be something that I'd be interested in doing definitely is kind of like a kind of a little bit of mental well-being, a little bit of crafting type of thing for kids. I would definitely do something like that. That's for me. I'm just, uh, I taught a little class at a middle school and my son was in middle school and it was one of those fun, I don't know, I, just seeing, even just seeing a couple of the kids get it, you know, like being able to produce like a knit stitch and one of them I sent, she was so excited, I sent her home with, you know, a yarn and 
needles and she, you know, she wanted to take everything with her. And it was just such an exciting moment. And she came back having knitted, you know, a swatch or a little piece of a scarf. And she was just so excited. There's something about that that's really, I, I'm guessing, having taught your daughters, you know, you, you see that little spark of like, oh, this is, I can do this. You know, it's like a, I don't know. It, it's nice to see kids have a chance to um, express themselves in that way. Cause it's not something yeah. in all cultures where, you know, you, they're, they're allowed to be creative as part of their everyday experience. Yeah. So, Yeah, definitely. I mean, I didn't really learn to knit properly until I was in my twenties. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, and I feel as if like I've always had that a creative side, but hadn't necessarily found my medium. So, uh, you know, it would have been lovely to have, have learned earlier, I think, uh, to yeah. see where that would have taken me, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've got, to, we've got to equip the next generation of knitters, haven't we, get them ready. <laughs> I think so, I think so. So um, as we're kind of wrapping up the interview, I have one kind of funny last question for you, because every interview has to have a funny, weird question. You know, like if you were a tomato, what kind of tomato would you be? Um, I mean, <laughs> I was, uh, I watch a lot of food television. Um, that's like my other interest is baking and cooking and things. So, um, you know, you often hear on those shows, like someone say like, put yourself on a plate, you know, like what, what is your, what is your kind of like your dish, your statement dish? And I'm curious to like translate that to sweaters. Like, so if you were a garment, like what kind of garment would you be? And I have a guess, but I'm curious to hear what you might say. Yeah, first of all, of course I would be a sweater because it's my favorite thing to knit. Um, definitely top down so I can make the sleeves ridiculously long for what I need. Um, and it would have to be color work, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, gosh, I guess I would choose colorwork sweater most likely with the colorwork and it'd probably be a yoke because that is my favorite to wear um colorwork down the sleeves and the body because I don't want to get bored um and yeah something I guess quite a quite a delicate design um because that's just what I like uh I don't know it's really hard it's hard to just choose one that's what I thought. I thought maybe that, um, you know, choosing one of your sweaters, it's kind of like choosing one of your children, you know, they're all like so special and so unique and, you know, you, you created them for different purposes at different times and different contexts. So it's like, they all have a special kind of place in your heart. And that's, yeah, I th I've always thought that question of like, what would you, what would you be if you were whatever is, it's a difficult one because it asks you to choose and you don't want to choose all the time. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about this for the next week, trying to work out what my <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much um for doing this interview and uh I'm really excited for to share your work with more people since I enjoyed knitting your sweater so much so um so thank you for taking the time to to talk to me today oh thank you it's been absolutely lovely to talk to you thank you for having me <laughs> And I just wanted to pop in at the end of the video and say a huge thank you to Rachel Ilsley for uh, taking the time out of her busy schedule to do this interview for us. It was great getting to know her and talk to her a little bit more about her process and kind of nerd out a little bit about uh, all the math and the pattern design. So I hope you enjoyed the interview and I will see you in a couple weeks for the podcast. Take care. Mm -hmm.